Hi, I'm Terry, and this is It's About Writing. Today we have author Ken Culkin, and he is a fiction writer and a nonfiction writer. And he would he would like to share with us today about writing in the spirit and inspiration and faith. And well, Ken, why don't you just introduce yourself and talk about what you write and um, show us your books and anything you'd like to share with us to start. All right. Uh, yeah, I I've been writing for forever, um, and um, I started off with 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 fiction, and then at one point I um, was offered to write for the San Diego Reader, and they they uh, wanted me to write nonfiction. So they had a very it was a very good paying market. So I decided to try that, and discovered that it was it was much the same. I I don't think writing stories is different if they're fiction or nonfiction too much. So, um, except, you know, obviously with fiction, you get to make it up a little bit more. Right. Nonfiction, you still make a little bit up, but not, not as much. Um, I was talking to my cousin the other day who wrote a qu quite an intriguing novel about experiences that happened to him in Vietnam, but he never has quite, um, decided whether it's a novel or whether it's a memoir because it's very close to the truth but then he you know he fudged on a couple of things to make it more exciting so mm. I think there there's a big overlap but primarily I've I started writing mysteries when I had my first novel came out it was called Midheaven and um, it was about a girl that became a Christian in d during her senior year in high school she kind of went from being a sort of a hippie with you know using drugs and you know experimenting with sex and stuff and then she became a christian and and got um very very devoted and then she happened to fall in love with this fellow that's not a christian and and whose mother was um a extraordinarily wicked person who masked rated I would say as a Christian so it was a, it was quite a conflict wow and from there I after that I wrote a couple of baseball novels actually and I didn't have a lot of luck finding a publisher with them oh. so I decided to write a an adventure novel well I had finished it and I showed it to some friends of mine that were mystery writers and they said hey this is a mystery novel so why don't you send it to this contest so I did and I changed the guy and I made him into a, a private investigator who was not investigating, you know, at the time he was in the military, he was an MP on the border. It was during World War II. And so um, I won a contest called the Private Eye Writers of America Best First Novel Contest. Wow. So yeah, suddenly I was a, you know, I was a mystery novelist. So it happened that that very time when I um, found out I won that contest, I was, was at, in Lake Tahoe with my kids and, and I had two teenage kids and I had two of their friends along and they were driving me crazy. And so I left them in the motel one day and went out walking on the beach and suddenly three other novels came to me that were part of that series. Oh, that's so great. Yeah, the novel then became a series before it ever came out. And I wrote those three and then I decided I needed some to go and do some background on those. So I wrote some other ones that took place before. And then I wrote some that took place after. And so I ended up with this 10 book series, which is what I'm trying to uh, sort of, I don't know, I've been revising some of them, but I also am republishing them as eBooks because I wanted them to come out all in a, in a sort of a, you know, a, a chronological order, which they didn't before. Oh, okay. So were they a few of them published before? Oh yeah, all of them were published. Oh, all of them. Were. Seven of them were published before. Okay. And then the three of them are coming out with this series. Okay. And do you have any books with you that you can show us? I do. Yeah. This is the um. Wait. This is. One that's about it's about the um, the son of the main character Tom Hickey, 
and this is takes place during the during the early 70s in, in Northern California, hence the little marijuana things on the um, okay. <laughs> glasses. It's it happens at a folk festival in in Northern California. So that's that's okay. what that cover is all about. And this one um, is a pretty radical Christian book, I believe. It's um called The Vagabond Virgins, and it's about a a woman that in Mexico who is um, appears and is presented as being the the Virgin of Guadalupe returning to um, you know to visit people, and she is lobbying against the the ruling party in Mexico. It happens like around 1980. Okay. And so she preaches a lot. So there's a lot of preaching in here. Mainly she preaches against people that are like what she thinks the PRI in Mexico is, which is a very rich and established and brutal regime. So anyway, and then this one, I'm gonna tell you a little about this one. I I have a, I've, I've, I've been long been kind of in between markets. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't, I don't know that I've ever quite found my niche because um, I, th with this book, when, in the first version, when I wrote it several years ago, I sent it to a guy named Les Stobie, who is a Christian agent. Oh yeah, I've I, heard of him. <laughs> yeah, very nice guy. I had, um, I'd had several other agents and things hadn't, you know, it was worked out. So I was without an agent at the time and I sent the book to Les Stobie and he, he told me that he liked it very much, but that he didn't know that he could sell it because he said it was it was too Christian for the um, too Christian for the secular market, for the mainstream market, and too too um, sexy for the the uh, uh, you know Christian, Christian market. market. Yeah. And so I I I said you know this puzzles me. Not I don't I can understand why it might be too Christian for the mainstream market, but um, I don't understand what why it would be too sexy for anybody because there isn't any sex in it. And he said, "Yeah, but the main character thinks about sex." You know? And he he did sure, but he didn't. I don't think this guy thought about sex as much as most even Christian men do. Right. So, you know, I I I guess I've always been in a situation where I've wanted to write stuff that that um, reflected my own faith but that was was realistic and not that was meeting somebody else's expectations. Yeah. <laughs> kind of a, an issue. Yeah. Was it recently that um, that happened or what, has it been a while? I think it was about five years ago. Maybe. Oh, okay. I wondered if things had changed in the last like five or 10 years on things like that with, in the Christian markets. I think the secular markets are starting to change as far as being more open to books of faith that have faith in them somewhere. I certainly hope so. Yeah, that, that would be wonderful. But I haven't found any evidence of it yet. Do, yeah. you, do you know anybody in particular that you would? I don't know it that well. I just, um, it seems like I've heard from different writers that um, just that they're more open you know, in general, um, because it's not so looked down on now to have faith or to have a character in the book who, ha who is a person of faith, you know. Um, so well, that's, that's encouraging that's, a little bit. That's very good news and I'm glad to hear it. I don't, I don't know, you know, I don't, keep, I don't keep up on it that much. I just yeah. pretty much, right. <laughs> I'm not good at it either. I'm not good at sending things in and I'm not good at, sticking to one genre either <laughs> so what, what do you write um i write fiction i've done a, a couple of ya um i have one fantasy one biblical fiction and i've done some contemporary women's fiction so but i haven't i haven't been published and i'm not good like i said i haven't been really faithful to send things out so i need to do that more <laughs> It's difficult because I mean I you know that's something that I've written about in the in my book writing in the spirit, which is basically just a lot of suggestions and and reflections about what we need to do to be open to the Holy Spirit to give us 
you know, give us mm -hmm. ideas and whatever. And, um, or, you know, if people are, are not, uh, don't believe that writers get stuff from the Holy Spirit, then they can call it whatever they want. But it's basically how to get whatever we think of as inspiration where stuff just comes to us, you know, where it doesn't mm -hmm. seem to follow any particular path to get there. But anyway, was I saying, oh yeah, there was a, um, a time when, oh my gosh, I just had a senior moment, I think. <laughs> Any, anyway, in writing in the spirit, there, there are a whole lot of suggestions about, about how one can be in the right, you know, moment um, to be accepting of things that, that are offered to us. Mm -hmm. So can you give us a few pointers from your book? Oh, from the writing in the spirit? I could yeah. if I could get up and get it. Let's, oh no, I, wait a minute. If I, if I minimize this, that's not going to work, is it? Uh, yeah, I don't, it won't affect my recording. If you minimize it on what you see, it, it should be fine. And so you could still see me uh, talking and such? I think so, yeah. Let me try it, okay? Okay, let's try. <laughs> okay, because then I can get into the file, I hope. Yeah, I was interested in that. You know, it, I think a lot of writers would enjoy hearing about how, you know, if there's steps or, or what you just think about um, to get that kind of inspiration from the Lord. Well, yeah, I have it. You know, I, the, the best thing I can do there is just to refer people to this podcast because it's on Podbean and uh, anybody that would like to get a, a direction to it, I can send them a, send them a, um, you know, a link to it. Also, also, I have a, a, uh, a newsletter that I send out about every other week. And it can be accessed as all kinds of links on my website, there's a link to it. And um, you know what, I'm not going to continue with this what I was doing. Okay, that's I'm all right. Um, but I will attach the website, and if you have a link for the podcast, I can attach it to this too, so people will be able to see it. Okay. Right with the YouTube video. Yeah, but how about just off the top of your head, what are some, give us some pointers for writers. Well, I guess the, the, the thing that's most on my mind is what, what was on a podcast this last weekend is... Um, I can't get you back now. Oh no. I see you. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess that's what important what's important. <laughs> yeah. Um I see you too. So Okay. Maybe if I do this little button with a green thing. There there we are. There okay. we're all. Okay. Okay. Um what I what I was writing about is being ridiculous. There's one of my very favorite writers is is um Dostoevsky, Fyodor Dostoevsky, and in his novel, The, the uh, Brothers Karamazov, there is a Alyosha who is an extraordinarily um, faithful, devoted, sort of a monk. He's been a monk, and um, but he's out in the world now trying to save his brothers from some terrible stuff. So he, um, this guy asked him, he said, is this, is this very ridiculous what I just said, Alyosha? And Alyosha pretty much says, you know, d don't even think about being ridiculous. He says, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, uh, it's a curse of our age. He says, even the most clever people, they're always worried about being, being uh, ridiculous. He says, it's a, it's, it, it's just, the, it's the devil. It's the devil that does that to us. <laughs> And you know the 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 more that we can think loosely and think um, just like you know who who we are and and what uh, what we want to rep what we want to write and what we want our words to be and not to worry about um, anybody 
thinking that's silly or whatever. The, the, the more we, we, we lean toward other people's understanding rather than our own, the, the farther we'll get from having a unique voice, which is what's going to make us or break us. In many cases, it might break us. I, if, are you you're familiar with Garrison Keillor? Yeah. Very Home Companion? Yeah. Lately, I've been in Minnesota for 20 years. So, (laughs) well, lately, I've been listening to some of that stuff when I go exercise and things. I have it, you know, I get it on a on an audio book. And and he uh, one he was going off about something very strange and wonderful happened when he was a kid. But he um, and he felt like God wanted him to tell that to people, but he was very reluctant because he he knew somehow that he didn't want to be a prophet because prophets are always um, ignored and or um, used badly by people and that people most want to just hear stuff that entertains them and also what is um, comfortable to them. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think sometimes when we are ourselves, we write stuff and we worry about whether people will be comfortable with it Mm. and that to me is it might be the way to make money but it's not the way to make art and I'm more considering about how to make something very good and and as best I can do it or not I don't you know pretend to be Shakespeare or anything but I I want to make when when I talk about making art it's it's about making something as good to my own standards as I believe I can Mm -hmm which is why I've gone back over these novels that I wrote years ago and I've revised them in, 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 uh, in a real sense. I've, I haven't changed anything of the storylines, but I've done a lot of fixing in the mm-hmm. prose because I'm very concerned about, you know, making it as good as I can because right. Right. Have I got. if I make money, I'll just give it to my kids and they'll spend it anyway. So. <laughs> which they won't mind. <laughs> no, they won't find that, but they can write their own books. If they want right, to right. Uh, I'm just kidding. My kids are wonderful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much. Um, we will look for your books and look up that podcast. I appreciate it. Did you have anything else yes. you'd like to share with writers? Well, I, I, um, I could go on forever, but if if I had that writing in the spirit book handy, I'm, I'm trying to think of one of the things that um, I, I relate a lot of little episodes. And there was one where um, I was in a coffee shop with some people up and I used to teach at Cal State Chico mm-hmm. and University of Arizona and several places. And I taught creative writing and this one young woman, she said to me, she said, how do you know so what makes you keep writing? I mean, how do you know it, it, it'll ever pay off? And I just said, well, you know, to me, the payoff would be if I, by the end of my life, I created a masterpiece. And um, even if it was one short story that was really a masterpiece. And and she said, but, but what good is that? And it's just, I don't know. It's just, if I, I, if you set out and you try to do something that is, that is extraordinary, then I believe it's a, it's a, um, it's a goal on it in its own that can keep, that can keep you working and working and working. I've been doing this for very many years and I don't think I could possibly stop unless I just can't do it anymore. So maybe I just have to keep writing easier books yeah. and use less vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you talked about writing a, a YA book. I ha- I have one in progress, and I was thinking, you know, I, as as I get older, then maybe I need to sort of get younger in what I write. You know, mm-hmm. so I'll write this YA book, and then I'll probably do some, like a preteen book, and then I'll end up doing a children's kids book, and maybe I'll end up drawing pictures or something. So yeah, well, that's good. <laughs> But it's just the creative process that to me is is so important. Yeah. I've heard uh, different writers say, if you cannot write, if, if you can leave it alone and not write, 
then do it, you know? <laughs> but, but, but writers, we can't leave it alone. So we come back to it. No, I, you know, I, I, I have said that I think a lot of times myself, it's, but it's because it's, it's, it's for the most part, it's not a very lucrative profession. Right. I think I could have made a lot of money doing other stuff. But writing isn't one of them. But I, I would have been much better investing in San Diego real estate. That's for sure. Yeah. But I have always just, you know, worked. And then when I had enough resources to put aside day jobs for a while, I would do that and I would write. And, I, and I, I've done fine. You know, I mean, I'm not not suffering, but I have um, mostly taught that's where most of my money has come from teaching writing so not not from but i had a class one time when i was in, went to the university of iowa and and this is this is i think something i touch on in, in writing in the spirit but i had a class with john irving who wrote um, a lot of good books at you know, the world according to garp and and mm -hmm. uh, which is a good movie and also the uh, a prayer for Owen meanie which is a very fine book Anyway, he said when we first were in the class, he said, if you're a fiction writer, he said, you should take an attitude like a poet that you're never going to make a living from this. So you might as well, you know, get used to it and just, you know, find another way to make a living. And um, so then that I kind of took that to heart a little bit, but then Irving, about a year later, he made millions of dollars on one of his novels. He hadn't before that time. No. So, you know, it's just like, cause as, as a fiction writer, you always, there is the possibility that something's going to hit. You know, I have a, the biggest liar in Los Angeles, which is the first book of this um, series. Okay. Of this, of this Hickey family series. Mm -hmm. it, it touches on a lot of things. It it, it has a lot of um, a lot of uh, stuff about about um, you know race relations and um, politics and the media and and things that are going on right now and about the media sort of controlling the politics and mm -hmm. um, so. I have sent it around. It, it's with an agent now trying to place it as a film. Now, if it placed as a film and then that brought the series along, then suddenly I might be very wealthy. Mm -hmm. And I, I wouldn't go around calling myself a, you know, instant success because it's been about 50 years <laughs> I've been working yeah. toward it. But, you know, uh, it can happen. And so you always have that in the back of your mind. Right, right. It's what we all hope, but we can't plan on that. <laughs> well, and the other thing, another thing I mentioned, I think, in that book is it used to be, I, I give the advice is probably don't tell people if you're at a party, if you tell people you're a writer, then the next thing they're going to ask you is, um, um, well, what have you written? If you say, you know, publish some novels or something, then they'll say, well, did you make a lot of money on them? And honestly, they used to, I used to get that a lot of times and, and, you know, it was like, and then if, if I said no, then they would walk away. <laughs> but, so that was kind of depressing. So I started telling them that I would taught writing or something like that, but I wouldn't, I'm sorry, if I, if I have, if I have messed up the picture, I just a little bit nervous with my fingers and I keep clicking things. So. Oh, no, I um, think it's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I hope you're a good editor because maybe you can make me not sound like such a babbling idiot. No, I don't edit them at all. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, but I just appreciate you sharing your story and your writing and your experiences. Um, I think it's, it's good for writers to hear other writers. And usually we like that too. So, <laughs> yeah. so I appreciate that. And thank you so much for being on. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm delighted. Thanks.